uh, what is up right now is we're going to be having a panel uh, to discuss basically the role in media projects and how to engage the, um, you know, the public in the subject of healthy life extension, uh, you know, such as books, movies, uh, YouTube shows, et cetera, and how this can in turn help shape uh, public opinion and increase the odds of success of all of our initiatives. So uh, remember, while we're having this chat, audience members, you can leave some questions in the chat and hopefully, you know, we can collect some and we can uh, field them later. Uh, but let's dive into it. So joining us for the discussion, just to quickly introduce everyone, we have uh, Sonia Arison, founder of the 100 Plus Capital Investment Fund and best-selling author of the book 100 Plus, How the Coming Age of Longevity Will Change Everything from Careers, Relation, uh, careers and Relationships to Family and Faith. Pat Graziosi, voice actor and co-creator of the popular YouTube animation channel, Life Noggin, which recently passed 3 million subscribers, I believe, and who we've worked with uh, on a video in the past. Greg Grinberg, founder and leader of Actual Food, which builds technology to make healthy, sustainable eating easy for everyone, uh, and director of a forthcoming documentary movie on life extension, Life Plus. And finally, uh, our own Tim Maupin, Emmy award-winning cinematographer, video production team leader at Lifespan.io and director of the short film Last Generation to Die, which as mentioned is currently being uh, adapted into a feature length film. So before we dive into questions, I think it would be nice to hear briefly from each of you how you're doing in the current situation and broadly how your work intersects with the subject of uh, extending healthy human lifespan. So I guess, Sonia, I guess we could start with you. Um, there's there's good things and there's bad things. Um, you know, I didn't have to commute to come to this conference. So I'm really happy about that given uh, the time it is here in California. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, one of the things about COVID is I think it's making everybody uh, really aware of their health. And I think in the, in the long run, that's gonna be that's gonna be a good thing. Um, my work, what I'm doing right now is I'm spending most of my time uh, investing in longevity companies. Um, and so, and, and to me, um, you know, that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but to me, it's, it's a kind of a broader, a broader area. It's not just the, what you expect, like the regenerative medicine and, um, and nanotech and, and those kind of things. It's all, it, it is those things. Um, but it's also things like, um, you know, uh, new food sources and clean water and because we can't be healthy without those things. I mean, we just, uh, we shrivel up. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what I'm doing. And, um, you know, hopefully, uh, the world uh, will become a better place and we can get through this crisis. Great. Well, I'm glad you're also putting your money behind it and not just, you know, thoughts. So that's good. Right. Action. Yes, it's important to do that. <laughs> yep. Uh, I guess, uh, Greg, next up you. Well, thanks, Keith. It's really great to be on this panel here. Um, I'm doing okay. I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to say that everybody in my world is happy and healthy. I mean, as happy as can be in a situation like this, but everybody in my world is healthy. And I think that is um, that connects fundamentally to why I do what I do, both at Actual Food and with Life Plus, that, you know, I, fundamentally what it is, is that uh, there are people in the world who I love and I want them to stay healthy. And um, all signs are pointing in the same direction at this point. So it's been, uh, it, you know, it's been a, a highly focused time, I would say, uh, a time of, uh, of, of uh, work and uh, work and work. And, and I think that's a good thing. I think that's, that's the right thing to be focusing on right now. Great. I totally understood. Uh, how about you, Tim? Uh, well, uh, thankfully, you know, as you know, Keith, uh, there's a lot of great things we can still do in post-production at LEAF. So we've been pretty busy. We just launched a new series called Science to Save the World, which <clears throat> from my perspective, uh, as everyone has said, like along with life extension, you know, there's many things we need to do for the, for the world. Obviously, uh, 2020 is a perfect example to highlight that. And so, you know, we're trying to do as much as we can in addition to the uh, life extension initiatives. Um, I'm doing all right. I mean, I think being in New York City has been a little rough here and there, but you know, we're surviving and uh, trying to get as much nature as possible in this time. And um, I'm, you know, slowly and consistently developing my feature film. So that's a pretty good broad overview, I suppose. <clears throat> nice. I bet that's uh, challenging in the current times, but I'm glad you're uh, proceeding ahead. Um, and Patrick, how about you? Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I am, oh, we, I went through a lot of uh, life events in the last two months. I got married, moved across the country, bought a house. <laughs> so, and all uh, stuff that uh, seems wild now in these times. So um, 
a lot of life events. And um, we moved to be closer to family and we moved to, um, to uh, just relax. We were in California, moved to Virginia. Um, and uh, with, with my business, I realized that we could just do everything from home. I mean, we were in California trying to get a studio space and um, we probably could get something because commercial real estate is not doing real, uh, well right now. We probably could have got something for really, really cheap, but we decided to move, do everything from home. And uh, so right now I've just been working on setting up the, the business so that it can run here um, and we wouldn't skip a beat. That's what I've been up to. It's been a lot. Gotcha, yeah. Uh, thankfully on my side to echo uh, Greg's sentiment from earlier, I'm lucky in that no one personally that I know uh, or am close to has gotten you know, COVID thus far. So I guess I've really lucked out. So thankfully, um, you know, my life has not been too disrupted and our operations at lifespan.io are pretty much always online anyway. So almost business as usual, but obviously just like everyone, we want the world to get uh, back to normal as soon as possible. So to transition to the questions, first, I'd like to just sort of pitch like a very broad question. Uh, anyone can field it at first. Uh, basically, it's on the tone of the work you're all engaged in to, you know, in some way or another to forecast a positive vision of what the future can become with the addition of advances such as increased healthy lifespans. This is very different from the, you know, parade of dystopias that we usually see on, you know, Netflix, et cetera. So why have you chosen to make this kind of content and what unique challenges do you think it presents to engage people with positive visions of the future instead of negative visions? So open to the floor. Um, I, can, I can start if you want, since I started last time. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so my book, 100 Plus, How the Coming Age of Longevity Will Change Everything, um, that was uh, an attempt to wake people up. So that's why I did it. Um, uh, so, you know, to, uh, and, and, and to talk about the facts, really, because, uh, you know, before I wrote the book, um, and the book was published in, uh, in 2011 now, so it's been a while. Longevity has legs. I'm still doing talks on the book all over the world. It's incredible um, because it hasn't, you know, I mean, the science might have moved along and it has moved along quite a bit. So my science chapter is outdated, but the rest of the book isn't. Um, and, uh, you know, I think... Um, that there were all these things that were going on in labs and uh, science labs and uh, you know all around the world and most people didn't know about it and they didn't they didn't know there was this sort of longevity revolution in the making and so i felt it was my duty to um to point it out and not only point it out but um point out how this will lead to a better future and so you know i, I took a look at a whole bunch of different areas like the economy and family life and um uh, we know what, what happens to the environment and um, even what happens to our religious institutions in a world where we can live longer, healthier lives. Um, so, so it's a big book. It takes on a lot of subjects. Um, but I thought it was necessary. And I, I, th I think if we're going to live longer and healthier lives, and we will, by the way, it's just a matter of, you know, when, not if, um, uh, you know, we should be ready for it. And we should be thinking about how uh, maybe we reorganize society and how, how society looks in the long term. So that's why I did it, because I think people should know the facts and, and, um, and should uh, shake themselves out of the dystopias and, and look towards uh, a more positive future. Absolutely. Well, you'll obviously get no arguments here. Uh, Pat, let me uh, transition that over to you. So uh, given what Sonia was just talking about, uh, in your process of making a very successful educational YouTube show, have you noticed any uh, you know, trends that are different when you focus on, you know, these positive societal effects versus your darker episodes? Is there any difference in, you know, how the audience responds? Yeah. So when we made the um, video for, for Lifespan, we were actually super nervous. I don't think I told you this. We were super nervous to, to make this because we were, it's, it's a younger audience, 18 to 24. And it, it's when they just start caring about this kind of stuff. Um, and so we framed it in a way where like, what if you can live a hundred more years, you know, like, what would you do with a hundred more years? Um, you know, and in that video, we asked, we asked that question at the end, we said, what would you do with it? How would you spend your time getting people to think of all of the things that they can do, all the, the fun memories that they could make if they could just keep on living. Right. Um, we didn't want to frame it in a way where, uh, 
yeah, the earth is going to, uh, to be a terrible place to live and you're going to have to live through that. Like, no, if we have the ability to live forever, we're going to be able to shape it however we want. Um, and so I think that it was nice to go the positive route. I think with life noggin, a lot of the times we'll, we'll make a video that's like, what happens if you get struck by lightning? You know, and, and it's, it's a terrible scenario, but now you get the science behind it. It's kind of exciting with life extension. I think it's how can I spin this in a way that will get people excited when they have no idea what it is. You know, you can't just say like, this is the, the, the technology that will make you live forever. It's like, okay. But so many people have sold that, you know, like I want to, what, what reason do I have to be excited about that? So that's why or that's how we approached it when we were doing that video. And I started, I started life noggin because I wanted to mix science and art together and two things that not, not necessarily, like not many people necessarily put together. Um, and I'm glad that I got to mix the two. And I think with, um, when we made that video, I think it was great that I was just able to um, bring people in that might not have known that they were excited about it, presented in a way that was really fun to them. Great. And I think if I remember right, you know, on YouTube, you can see like, you know, the like and dislikes and the ratio and stuff. I think the ratio was was good on that one. So people responded positively. It was very good. <laughs> one, of, one of my one of my favorite comments on that uh, real quick, I'll just share was that somebody said, um, if I got to live, uh, you know, forever, I'd, I'd spend more time with my mom, you know, and that that made me so happy like that. The people are thinking about it in that regard. Right. I think that's a good way to parlay it to uh, to Tim and Greg here, because I think one thing that we've all noticed and I've heard it echoed in a lot of the different talks here at the conference is that, you know, while obviously the science is super important, if you actually want to make this happen, right, when you're when you're talking to the public, when you're talking to policymakers, it always comes down to the emotional, right? Like, how does it relate to your life? So on that subject, I guess, pitch to, you know, Tim and Greg, you know, you're both working on uh, feature length movies, different types, you know, fiction versus uh, documentary, but you know, how do you basically envision, like, what's the best way that you can engage people in this positive, you know, like I just mentioned, dystopias are super um, popular. That's what sells now. How has it gone for you personally when you're trying to sell this positive vision, I guess, either Tim or Greg, for funding and getting people interested in your movie projects? Go for it, Greg. All right. Well, I guess... Um... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in a way the, the question you're asking, Keith, here is in, in its sense, it's a deeply metaphysical question. You know, why be positive as opposed to negative? Um, you might as well ask a proton that question, I think. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I love to be, I love conferences. I love this conference, by the way, Keith, because I get to actually say things like that um, that, are, that, that come to mind. But um, no, I mean, to me, I think that the longevity movement is at a critical place. I think that what Aubrey has been able to do over the like less than 20 years, taking this heretical idea and bringing it to the mainstream of gerontology is just absolutely incredible. And what you guys are doing at LEAF, t you know, turning science enthusiasts into evangelists and, uh, you know, people who are excited about the movement is really incredible. So to me, the, you know, the next step, and I know that, that you guys share this, this idea at LEAF too, you know, that the next step is to, is to address the general public and try to create a movement within the general public to support, to support longevity. And, um, you know, I come at it, so, so I come at it actually sort of very strategically. I mean, I'm not, I don't come at, come at it as a storyteller first. I come at, come at it as someone who is behind longevity first. I mean, it's the same, the same set of reasons that led me to start actual food, that I think that the chronic disease epidemic is terrible. I think it's horrible that, that two thirds of people, you know, two thirds of deaths are caused by this thing that is, that is preventable with a great deal of work, but it's preventable. So, um, so, so to me, storytelling is just a tool. Um, and the, the answer in, you know, to the question of, uh, of sort of, you know, what, what our approach is, is that in a way we're, we're sort of taking the same approach that, that longevity science is, namely we're looking at it as, as, as something that needs to be researched you know, the, the, we, need to dis we need to actually do the work of discovering how to talk to the public in such a way that the pro-aging trance isn't triggered. You know, how can we sidestep those sort of autonomic objections and just tell our story about what we're trying to do 
in a way that is emotionally resonant and then and bypasses those those sort of the, the usual litany of kind of unconsidered responses that we that we tend to get. Yeah, I think one thing that's very relevant here, and it kind of echoes uh, the earlier panel that Elena had did yesterday, um, basically that what I liked about what you just said, Greg, and this will be a good tee up for Tim, that persuasion is a science too. And it's, mm -hmm. it, it's valuable for all of us to understand ideas like the backfire bias, right? And if you want to convince someone, you know, it's easier to, 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 to lead someone to realize that they've always been on your team all along instead of to try to get them to switch a position, right? You know, so you don't butt heads. Uh, so, Tim, that, that's a good question over to you. One of the things that I know that you're working on in your movie, maybe a little bit in contrast to what Greg just said, is instead of coming out as sort of explicitly like pro longevity, you're trying to engage a topic in sort of a softer way, you know, where people just come to it on their own. So maybe you can talk about, you know, why you're doing that or, or you know. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think the challenge as a as a storyteller and filmmaker in a sort of fiction narrative sense is, uh, you know, there's an obvious reason why dystopias are interesting. That there's an inherent inherent conflict, and and I don't think all dystopias are bad. I think sometimes cautionary tales are good. Like we need that stuff occasionally for certain stories. But um, but I yeah, I think with the life extension thing, for me, it's always been very nuanced. I came at it personally as more of like an open question, like when I first started reading about it and so forth. And so I think. Uh, I personally believe a lot in the sort of like, like the subtle psyche that you can change with people. And I think I certainly believe in emotion as a filmmaker. And I think people make decisions a lot on emotion. And so for me, um, the challenge has been so you, you need conflicts and good drama in a story. So if it's not a dystopia or dystopic film, where does that come from? And so uh, so it's been kind of a challenge of like, how do we do that? But I think the reality is. Even if life extension happens, as we all know humans are gonna, there's always gonna be drama. There's always gonna be, you know, things that we were dealing with and issues like that. So I think it actually became, it's sort of like more looking at uh, the film particularly looks at a family and how that affects uh, how life extension would interact with, you know, sort of typical family drama. So I always tell people, I don't even think of it as, as much of a science fiction film as I think of, think of it as a drama set in the future. And I think that's important to kind of keep this subtle nuanced view of it at the same time with a positive uh, sort of overall tone, I think. So, and to me, again, I believe if you challenge your audience and make them ask questions and think about the things you're presenting to them rather than just making a propaganda film, I think it's way more powerful and it's gonna have a lot longer of a uh, lifespan. Uh, no pun intended there, so. <clears throat> well, that makes sense to me. And as a follow-up question to this, I, I guess it probably will make sense to go to Pat first on this since you'll probably have hard data on this is, Given that we're kind of, you know, let's just call it what it is, that we're almost kind of living through a kind of dystopic moment right now, you might wonder, like, does that make people bored with dystopias, more hungry for utopic kind of literature and, and, and uh, you know, more looking for the positive in their escapist media, right? So first, I'll kick it, that'll go to everyone, like how have things changed in the last six months for you and your work? But Patrick, ha have you noticed, like, any metric changes in YouTube and, and, and certain videos have gone up, certain videos have gone down, et cetera. Yeah. So it's, it's really funny that you bring that up. So um, I was having this conversation with my friend yesterday about how um, when times are really tough, normally people will try to, uh, like if you're sad, you go and listen to a sad song. You want to feel that emotion that you're in. Um, but what I think is happening now, and I could see this with Life Noggin, is that people are gravitating more towards the videos that are just more lighthearted that that aren't trying to bring them down. I mean there's so many there's so many videos that were made about covid and all of them were essentially uh yep, we're doomed, you know, and it, and and it's like I can go on Twitter and get that or I can talk to my family, you know, if I if I want to feel some dread, right? I I don't need to go and and watch YouTube, but that's my escape uh, if I want to get that stuff. So I have noticed that people are gravitating more towards the positive things, but, um, you know, we made a video that was myths surrounding the coronavirus. So instead of saying like, here's all the bad stuff that's happening, here's why you can, it, you just relax. It's okay. You know, like it's, you're, you don't have to microwave your mail that some people are doing. Um, so let's, let's go on a, let's go on a more positive route. Let's, let's try to, calm the nerves of some people. And like, and like Tim was saying, um, it's, it's okay to do a cautionary tale every once in a while. Like it, it, that, that's important to, to tell people that stuff. But 
I think people get that from media so much that actually going the positive route is a little more uh, inspiring and probably a little more revolutionary now at this point. Absolutely. Sonia, Greg, anyone want to follow that up with their own experiences? Well, I, I, I think people, uh, people's mindsets certainly have changed. Um, we live in a completely different world. And I think, you know, from what I can see, um, most people are willing to entertain the idea that the institutions we've set in place are not maybe the right ones. And some of the decisions we've made are maybe not the right ones. And if, if that's the case, then maybe all the premises that we made those decisions upon aren't the right ones either. And so I think we're, we are actually at this time where people's brains are a bit more plastic and they're, they're willing to think about things um, in a different way um, and, and different topics than they would have thought of in the past as well. Um, so, so I think we're at a really special time actually. And, um, I, w I was actually just thinking about it yesterday. You know, I have these conversations all the time, actually about when, you know, I, th I think this is a really good time for us to do something as a, as a group, as a, as a life extension community. Um, but the, the question is when you don't want to do it too soon. Like when, when the pandemic's still going on and everyone's still in crisis mode, that's probably not the right time. You have to kind of be, I think you need to be ready to do it kind of like right as it's ending. You're like, hey, oh my God, we're getting out of this. Thank God we survived it. And now let's build the future in the right way, right? Yeah. So here, here's the plan to go forward. I think, I think we kind of, I think as a community, we need to be ready to do that. And I'm not sure what we've put together a plan yet. And I, I think we need to do that. Absolutely. Um, to, to peer behind the curtain a little bit for myself, um, I was thinking very hard in my opening talk that you might have watched of mm -hmm. how to phrase that part where I said that, you know, where you want to say it's absolutely right for the scientific community to focus on the present problem. But when it's done, don't forget that we now need to, you know, like you have to, you know, you don't want to steal, you don't want to seem too mercenary and like capitalizing on the current moment. But still, it is true. It is an opportunity, right? Um, I like something that you said there that made me think of, I think it's a quote that's, that's usually attributed to William Gibson, the, the author of Neuromancer. Uh, but basically the idea that as a, as a creative person, as an artist, as, a, as an author or media producer, in some sense, you can, you can almost create the future in the work that you do. In some ways, uh, for example, William Gibson is created with creating the internet because you know he coined the term cyberspace and then computer programmers were like oh that's really interesting let's go build that uh so to, to pivot from what you said sonia i guess uh, to greg first here um in the media that you make what is it that you want to create in the world using your artistic avenue as a venue to help create it hopefully that made sense mm, absolutely well so first of all i can't claim any artistic talent per se here. <laughs> Again, I'm approaching this in a very strategic, very methodical, very research driven way. And most definitely bringing other people like Steve Katz, who is on the Life Plus team. Sorry about that. Who's like Steve Katz, who's on the Life Plus team and has, you know, who's had an extraordinary career in both, you know, in, in, in everything from, you know, from PR to narrative filmmaking to, you know, to animation to live action. I mean, he's, he's done it all. And so, um, but so, so I mean, I think that to, I, I think that your, I think that your point is absolutely spot on. I mean, there are so many reasons to be skeptical of humanity in this moment, and in any storytelling that we do, we can't ignore that. You know, we can't present, um, we can't present this sort of, um, I would say, Star Trek: The Next Generation kind of picture of it's a straight line from where we are to where we want to be. But I think it's important to remember in the narratives that we're offering that we've been in bad places before. And, you know, if you think back, you know, I, I'm a recovering physics guy, so I tend to bring a cosmic perspective to, to a lot of things. But, you know, if you think back over the last, you know, 13.8 billion years and all the things that had to happen for us to be here in this moment, you think back over the last three and a half billion years, all of our human and non-human ancestors, all the things that they, that they had to deal with, and, and in, I mean, in my lineage, I don't even have to really go back very far. I mean, it was 75 years ago this year that my grandfather started a hospital for his fellow survivors of the Holocaust after World War II. Um, and, you know, he had, a, he had a crisis on his hands. It was a very dark moment, but he did what he had to do. The, he, his community 
was sick. Mo the majority of people in his in his community of, of fellow survivors were, you know, were, were acutely ill. So I think that there are, you know, clearly, clearly sort of, uh, you know, um, a, a saccharine kind of um, glossing over um, of you know, of, of what we're, what we're all seeing here, you know, and not just with, not just with COVID, but I mean, you know, the, you know, police brutality, I mean, you know, democracy falling apart. I mean, there's a, there's a hell of a lot to, to be thinking about, and we can't just gloss over that in kind of a, in kind of a glib way. But what we can say is we've been in bad situations before and our forebears did what they had to do. And in the same way, I mean, you know, 60% of American adults have a chronic illness. I mean, you know, the majority, we are a sick country by any definition. You know, we are in a much more privileged position than my grandfather was starting that hospital with next to no resources, you know, kind of at the, at, you know, with the, with the help and the largesse of, you know, American GIs who were willing to disobey orders, you know, to get him the supplies he needed. I mean, we are, we are in a much, much better position than that. So to me, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I think that we have, uh, you know, we have an opportunity as a as a species uh, to go in one direction or another, and we have an opportunity as people as people who see that, as people who see aging and chronic disease and climate change and social equity as all part of the same thing on a on a on a very deep level, and also on a very practical level. You know, having you know that we're spending three trillion dollars a year treating chronic diseases, managing the progression in a very ineffective way. You know, one sixth of our GDP could could go a long way toward solving all of these other problems too. So I think it's very important from that perspective also to respond to people who say, "Well, okay, yeah, I mean, you know, chronic disease is bad, but what about climate change? Shouldn't we be focusing all of our efforts on climate change? Or you know, do I have time to think about this when there are you know federal troops occupying you know my yeah. city?" Yeah, the I answer has uh, to be a resounding yes. Yeah, I think one of the things that's interesting there is how. Um, what we're trying to do can jive nicely with things that people care about already and are not uh, in opposition, you know, uh, for just one quick example, right? You know, climate change, right? You could see how someone could come to a life extension, you know, um, favoring person and say, hey, why should we put our money fo focused on that when the world is burning, right? But then you can clearly tie those two things together and say, well, you know, if you care about things like overpopulation that are, you know, going to accelerate, you know, heating the planet, well, increase healthy human lifespans actually decrease birth rates and will help that problem and then everybody's in, on the same team right so I, I think that's valuable um i want to uh, parlay it uh, over to tim so kind of feeding off of that um one of the questions that we get a lot at lifespan.io uh, it's always kind of like you know overly simplistic like hey you know uh you should really get matt damon on board you know and then everything will be easy right you know just get the celebrities right so as part of this sort of idea of trying to marry our cause to the causes that people care about, uh, Tim, you know, I know, I know when you're working on your movie, you're, you're dealing with some higher profile people. How have you found, like, what is a successful tactic to, to do that sort of bridging of the gap to in, in, entice someone? I don't know if you want to name any specific names, but uh, I'll just pitch it over to you. Well, you know, and to be honest, Keith, that's something that's sort of ongoing. I mean, it's, I don't know if I have uh, specific answers, but um, I think, you know, I think the first thing for me as a filmmaker is try to make it as good as you can. Is it a good script? Is it a good film? That's what's going to probably attract realistic, you know, interest or whatever. Um, that said, I mean, I think, you know, as we as we're getting closer to moving forward with it, you know, I think a strategy would be to try to look at uh, celebrities who are interested in it. Um, I mean, for me, it also has to work in terms of I don't know if I could just cast somebody purely on that. You know, I think there's a, just you just have to you have to think about the story first, but I think there's a way to marry those things. Um, but I also think to everyone's point, just kind of chiming in and in, in like sort of tying these two questions together. I think now is a, an interesting opportunity where people might, you know, celebrities might pay attention more. There, there aren't, everybody's not quite as busy. So they have time to sort of think and you can sort of ask things and so forth. And so that's maybe a, a part of the strategy um, I'm using. Um, I mean, I don't want to, uh, I have another project that we, we have uh, a celebrity, uh, who's kind of backing now and uh, it's a it is a science fiction type of series or whatever we haven't so far there's no life extension episodes but that may change in the future so so I think there are ways and you know I'm building connections and things like that um, so I don't uh, I honestly think 
I think when I did the Kickstarter for my short film, there was a lot of interest and a lot of, uh, you know, there were people who sort of came out and out of the woodwork. And so I honestly think, again, if you just have an interesting concept and, and just, and be real about it, I think that's the best way. So that's, that's going to be my kind of uh, strategy going forward. So. <clears throat> Great. That makes sense. Hopefully that's, uh, you know, that could help all of us uh, learn on how to entice, uh, you know, high profile individuals to get involved in our field. Um, I'm going to start transitioning now to some questions we're getting from the audience that I'll just kind of go to the field and anyone who wants to jump in. One of one of, of which is a very good question, but I think a softball. What are your favorite movies or books that had have some representation of the idea of life extension? Open to the floor. I can start. Um, I love Frankenstein. Uh, I think it's it's a very misunderstood book. If if uh, you know you've only seen the movies uh, and you picture Frankenstein as like, er, you know, the guy with the bolts in his neck. But if you if you read the book, um, it's very eloquent. It's very beautiful and it's very aspirational, um, and has also a lot of uh, amazing quotes that I think you can apply to your life. Of uh, you know, nothing tranquilizes the mind like a steady purpose. That's a great mm. quote. Anyway, that's my answer. So. <laughs> I guess, Sonia, anything? Looks like you're smiling, so I think you've got something in your mind. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by favorite. <laughs> um, I mean, there, there's a lot of dystopian uh, literature out there. I wrote an entire chapter on, in my book on um, all the dystopian uh, literature on life extension and like why we shouldn't bother trying to live longer because, you know, like Dorian Gray just turned mm -hmm. into this a horrible person and you know um you know they 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 uh, and in Jonathan Swift's Gulliver Travels like all the all the all the people who lived long became these awful tiny little people who just like like you no one could understand and um there and so there's uh i don't know if i would there's no, i don't really have a favorite to be honest i yeah i no nobody has written anything yet that i've read uh in this area that I could be like, yeah, this, this they they killed it. So I, I think I think there's an opportunity for somebody to do something very creative. Um, and you know, like Tim said earlier, it's very difficult to write a positive version of this that's like a fiction because you do need some kind of um, you know conflict to make the story happen. Uh, but somebody will do it at some point, and then that will be my favorite book. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try to. I'll get on it. I've been writing a book like everybody else in the world. It's Perfect. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> I guess, uh, Pat, how about you? Uh, they, well, this is, might be seem like the kind of a weird answer, but there's a movie called Her um, starring Joaquin Phoenix, right? Uh, and that movie talks about, uh, uh, it's really more AI and going on getting super developed and uh, transcending the need for, for humans. Um, but at the end of the movie, I uh, won't spoil it, but it's just more about the human connection uh, and how we should probably be relying more on each other um, than the tools around us. Um, at least that's what I got out of it. But um, I really like that movie because it kind of, it sets the tone for, I think what we should be paying attention to. Um, and it's great to um, to invest in technology that will better society, that will, that will help people. Um, but to truly ask ourselves, okay, why are we making this thing? And should we be paying attention to more of the relationships uh, and how the technology will affect the relationships uh, that people are going to have? If we are going to be continuing on for a long time, um, what should we be paying attention to? Um, so I like that movie as, a, as kind of a cautionary tale. Um, that, that's, that's my favorite so far, but uh, like Sonia said, there hasn't really been many um, positive ones that I know of where I left the movie going, I can't wait, <laughs> you know, to be invested in this. So, yeah. You know what I think, let me, let me jump back in since we're talking, since sure. we're on the thread still, is I was just thinking, thinking, well, what movies are there out there that, you know, so there was Robin Williams' Bicentennial Man. And I know he mm. was a, he was a supporter personally of, uh, of longevity. I think he even uh, donated to Sens. Um, and, uh, you know, somebody should rewrite that movie because that was actually the wrong movie. I don't know if you've seen it, but he he was uh, mm -hmm. he was this robot who uh, artificial intelligence that um, wanted to become human, and he was really smart and figured out how to like re uh, how to grow human organs in the lab and, and put them inside his his robot body. And eventually, he just regrew everything and he sort of became human. But this like 
immortal human kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the reason it was dystopian is because everybody around him, all the humans he loved, the reason he was trying to become human were dying. Mm -hmm. And then it, it, it was only him who had Im immortality and everybody else was dying. Um, but I think you could rewrite that actually to like, if he could grow them for himself, why can't he just grow them for his human friends and then the world is great, right? And then you would have some other kind of tension about people who don't want him to grow the stuff. And you know, like that could be redone. Absolutely. And I think that also kind of highlights two sort of, you know, some other common themes. Like you see this in all, not just life extension related topics, but almost in general with any sort of exceptional trait, you know, where, you know, the person has this extra gift, but they see it as a curse and it's all on we and it, it's only for them. Right. Where I think mm -hmm. if we can really bring that message that, you know, it's very easy to logic your way out of it. Be like, oh, well, if this technology happens, it's everyone always goes, well, what about like my parents? Like, no, this would apply to everybody. That's the whole point, <laughs> right? Otherwise, yeah. otherwise you're in a, in a very tragic situation. Another uh, honorable mention that I want to uh, mention before we take it over maybe to Tim and Greg is um, speaking about things that could be remade or redone for the modern age. The Epic of Gilgamesh. I'm shocked. Mm that there's never been any, as far as I can tell, any sort of modern retelling, any sort of movie. And what I like about the Epic of Gilgamesh is where all, all of the later epics like Beowulf and such, in a sense, they're almost all a sublimation of that. You know, they're trying to do something. They're trying to uh, live on in, in legacy and, you know, kill the dragon so everyone will think they're great. But Gilgamesh, the first epic, he goes for the thing itself. He wants to overcome aging and death, not just for himself in the end, but for all of society. And that's obviously a very timely message. So I'd like to see that one remade. Mm. Uh, uh, Tim, how about you? Any favorites? Well, yeah, and as everyone said, it's a little tricky to pick a favorite. Uh, but I, I guess I would say two films that, uh, while they don't exactly like highlight life extension, um, Darren Aronofsky's The Fountain, I think, is a pretty profound, it sort of ties the ideas of love to Im immortality and Again, not a direct tie, but also very interpretive, obviously. Uh, and then uh, Jim Jarmusch's um, "Only Lo Only Lovers Left Alive," which is sort of an sort of an offbeat type of thing, but it um, looks at vampires. But it does some interesting stuff in the sense of like, what would you do if you're, uh, you know, how would art change over time, and you know, poetry and sort and all those sorts of things. So I think those are two kind of they sort of tiptoe into it, and obviously their goal is not to promote it or anything like that but i think they're they they certainly present some interesting ideas so i would i would name those two probably is what came to mind immediately so makes sense and, and greg i think you're the only one left i i don't like any <laughs> and, uh, Fair answer. <laughs> my um you know my my knowledge of you know my exposure to longevity literature is by no means exhaustive so i don't mean to suggest that there aren't any good ones but i'm i do want to say emphatically i haven't seen it um and i i i think that you know, all the literature that I have seen, both fiction and nonfiction, um, you know, on this topic, um, I, I find that a lot of the time it really swings for the dirt. You know, it really, you know, it, it comes back with these themes that are just so trite. Um, you know, if you think about it for two seconds, you realize just how ridiculous it is to say something like, you know, death is what gives life meaning, you know, that with an out without an end, you know, our lives don't have, you know, any purpose. I mean, these, these are such trite themes that, um, you know, so, and, and when I think particularly about the, the genre of, of nonfiction, um, you, know, and, you know, particularly, you know, films and, and media coverage, you know, that, that have, have covered the longevity movement, you know, our movement, I, um, you know, I think that, I, I, I certainly don't think that there was any ill intent. I think that there was some, you know, you know, the, the people who, you know, who worked on that stuff, people who have written articles and, you know, people who have made films, you know, are, you know, are, you know, good, thoughtful people. But I do think it's time for us as a movement to take control of our own, take responsibility really for our own image in the public eye and, and have a, 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 a well-funded, well put together, well-crafted strategy um, that, you know, to, to mobilize the public um, with, um, you know, with media that is truly of, by, and for the movement. I, I like, yeah, I like the way that you answered that question. Yeah, absolutely. Because... Uh, I think it actually highlights why our field needs more artists, needs more philosophers, right? Because I think a lot of times when we engage in this issue, we don't have the proper footing, right? So that's a classic example, right? You know, death gives life meaning. Well, why do you say that, right? In some sense, it, it, all, it fits into this backdrop of, you know, life has this established curve of like, you know, 
being a baby, a toddler, adolescent, you know, adult, and then that's the flow that we expect. So in a sense, that vibe is really sort of a flavor of like the postmodern critique of science or progress in general. Like, well, the things the way they are is the way that they should be. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think you need artists, you need philosophers that to, to in good faith engage with that critique because it is a legitimate it is a legitimate critique. And I think it's one that we can successfully overcome, but we need to engage it. Right. So I think that's that's a good way to kind of parley what we're coming to the uh, the end here. So I want to give every person a chance here to basically have some closing thoughts on how we as a field can help uh, to, to bring in an aspect of one of the questions that I see coming from the audience. How can we, you know, transition the ideas of normal aging to something that we can address and something that we should address. So some final thoughts there and, you know, feel free to plug anything that you're doing as well. So Pat, let's start with you. Um, well, I guess to that point, um, my thing has always been, I want to make it fun for the outsiders. I want to make it fun for people that, that have no idea that they are, they're even excited about these things yet. Uh, and it's kind of challenging is when I'm doing consulting for science channels or, or anybody in the EDU space, they always ask me like, how do I make this thing not boring? And I think oftentimes you think that the thing that you're doing is boring, but it's not. It, what we're doing is super exciting. It, it, to us, it's revolutionary. To us, it's like the, the, the end all be all, right? But to somebody else, they might not care about it. So an example that we did, we did a, um, a VR video where you got to go inside of the human body. And you put on your VR goggles, you get to see this little animated, like uh, almost like a magic school bus kind of thing, right? And um, and people commented and saying like, oh, I was I I love this, I love VR. And then they got they they get excited about biology. They start to care about the human body. And it's coming from instead of saying like, this is why you should care about it. It's look how cool this thing is. And you, this is you. You don't even know this is happening inside you right now. And so I think more pieces should be made that are like that, that get people excited. I was in kitchen chemistry when I was in high school and kitchen chemistry was how does Coke and Mentos even work? <laughs> and, and, and stuff that people consider all the time, but maybe they don't just, they, maybe they don't care about it until it's presented in a cool way. That's what I think the, that we need to start going down is making more pieces that are super engaging because a younger audience is not thinking about this stuff. And they should be because that's the next generation that is going to be in charge of all this stuff that is going to get into some wealth that is going to be able to, to share their ideas. Absolutely. This, this is exciting stuff. So if we're not conveying that, that's on us and we need to do a better job. Sonia, how about you? You know, with, with my book, what I, what I really tried to do is to uh, inspire uh, people from all walks of life, like, like we've been saying. Um, and, and I routinely actually meet young people who have read my book, uh, who say that that was kind of one of the, one of the reasons they decided to, you know, go into doing what they're doing. And so like, we need, not only do we need more artists and, and philosophers and all of that, but we need more scientists too, because for a long time, you know, the area of longevity was thought to be this sort of snake oily type thing that, um, no respectable scientist wanted to enter. And so, um, it, it really is a cool area. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm always trying to work to get more people from every walk of life involved. Um, especially uh, donors as well, right? So we, we have money to, um, to do some of the things that we need to do in the, in the science area and, and, and investors as well. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that's what I'm always uh, working towards. And, um, you know, and I'm, I'm helping to fund companies now that hopefully, you know, some of them will have a big impact in our lives. Great. Well, so I guess I'll just wrap we'll, up with that. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we'll be able to all, you know, work together in some way going forward on that. Uh, Greg, how about you? Some final thoughts? And um, I know you got something to pitch, so. <laughs> well, thanks. So I guess what, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to draw a lesson from actual food as it applies to the longevity movement and what I think we need to do and why, why, we're, why we're bringing Life Plus to the movement and, uh, you know, which is, which is a, again, a public mobilization campaign that is up by and for the movement to ignite public demand for, for lasting health. Um, at Actual Food, we have a very similar problem. We're dealing with a very similar problem to what longevity is, which is we, we know that if people would just eat healthier and not just kind of in a generic way, but in a very specific way, we know that we can prevent and reverse chronic disease. We've proven it. It's, it's, it's uncontroversial in nutrition and nutritional biochemistry literature. 
but getting someone to actually do it outside of a controlled setting in a residential treatment setting where you can actually control what they're eating has been impossible. We've never been able to actually parlay that finding into, into the general public. And so the key, the key, I think, breakthrough for us was realizing that it's, that it's not really actually about convincing people of anything. It's all what behavioral marketing people call system one thinking versus system mm -hmm. two. It's, it's all about the subtleties of the way that you offer choices. So that brings me back to something that Aubrey said yesterday. He was describing, he was talking about unity and he was saying that, that clinical trials are just experiments. They're very expensive experiments, but they're just experiments and we have to keep that in mind. I think the thing that we need to be thinking about when it comes to presenting longevity to the public is that experiments in the realm of marketing and advertising and PR are actually extraordinarily cheap. And it behooves us to, to, to do those experiments, to do them liberally, because as any, as any smart three-year-old learns, the way that you ask um, for, you know, you, you, the way that you ask it has a tremendous impact on what the answer is. You know, you, you, you smile when you ask for cookies or whatever, you know, every kid learns that. We need to just apply that, that knowledge and learn from, learn from the fields of behavioral marketing, behavioral psychology, consumer psychology, and understand that, that people are black boxes. You know, we're, we, can, we can understand, you know, we, we, can, we can tune our inputs for the desired outputs. I mean, they're cha we're chaotic black boxes. We're highly sensitive to subtle, subtle changes in messaging. Let's not lament that. Let's use that as a way to build a public movement for longevity. That makes sense. Uh, maybe Tim, you can pick up the, that thought because I know it's very relevant to what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I guess for me overall, if, you know, tying up things we've talked about uh, prior, I, I think, um, you know, overall, I'm an, op I'm an optimist. And I think, um, you know, there's, there's certainly challenges, as we've all discussed, but I do believe in kind of leading with an optimism that I don't think it should be just uh, bland and, you know, it should acknowledge the issues that we have. And I think, you know, doing some of the things we're doing, uh, Keith, at Lifespan.io, like, I think, uh, you know, again, Science to Save the World, like tying it all together as a, like, it's not just life extension. We, you know, we all want to live on, but we want to live on in a good world. So like trying to push that idea that you can have both of these things, you can have, you know, and these are good reasons to live on. And again, just being realistic about it. Um, another sort of initiative I'm doing that's a part of Lifespan.io is something we're calling Lifespan Docs, which takes a look at a very short mini docs that takes a look at interesting lives that people have lived, you know, typically older people and and why they would want to live on. And, and I think that's a really good, subtle, optimistic way to paint the idea that there's still so much to do in life and like why we'd want to live on and so forth. And so, and then to tie it more personally, I think, you know, it's interesting. I've been working on this film for a while uh, and my, my father passed away last year. And I think that, I feel like I'm so much more ready to make this film in a way. And I think for me, it's about engaging people. And that's something that everyone can understand is like, we've all had something, you know, tragedy in our life or death or whatever. So, so just getting into that place. And then I think from there, you can actually get people to really think about it in a particular way. So, um, so yeah, I think that's, that ties it together for me. And uh, a little bit later today, I think the trailer for my short film is playing uh, if you're around to check it out. And yeah, so. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yep. I think, you know, the most important thing is basically meeting people where they are and engaging them on a personal, emotional level. Absolutely. Well, I think that does it for us. So thank you very much for all the participants. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this panel and thank you everyone to ask questions, our sponsors and lifespan heroes. Uh, and of course, everyone who's in attendance. <laughs>